You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid healthcare conversations with physician recruitment industry's top executives and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. We have Dr. Russell Gross back in the studio with us again. And today we'd like to get his thoughts on um, where you did your residency and fellowship and why did you choose surgery as a a profession. All right. Well, I started uh, my training in uh, California at UC Irvine at Long Beach Memorial Hospital. And uh, I did a year there and uh, there was a rotating type of uh, clerkship. So I did uh, OB, I did surgery, I did internal medicine, I did pediatrics. And uh, I had already decided that I really wanted to pursue surgery. So my actual internship was at uh, Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital and uh, did the surgical internship and uh, I still like doing it. I remember the first uh, uh, first epiphany when I was watching uh, Hernie and I realized how it, uh, how it works, how it comes together how to repair it and uh, that was uh, that was uh, good uh, I then uh, went to Portland Oregon where I did four years of general surgery and uh, again uh, I enjoyed my time there I like doing surgery I like being up in the middle of the night I like doing trauma and uh, our hospital was the knife and gun club so uh, we got all the good stuff and uh, it was an exciting mm-hmm. time and uh, lots of excitement, lots of interesting uh, cases. It was a high, high level, high quality uh, uh, institution at Emanuel Hospital in Portland, Oregon. I graduated from that program and uh, was uh, board eligible at that time. Uh, during my training uh, in general surgery, the thing that I liked doing the most was uh, vascular surgery. Uh, and uh, to me, that was uh, really starting to take off. At the time, there was really, I think, only one or two actual programs in vascular surgery. Uh, and the board for vascular surgery was just starting to kick off. So I wanted to get further training. And a friend of mine suggested, well, you're never going to get into a vascular surgery program because there aren't any. Uh, Why don't you do cardiovascular? You learn the same techniques, but you're doing them uh, mostly on the heart. So I applied and was accepted at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas, under uh, the direction of Denton Cooley, who was the foremost uh, cardiovascular surgeon in America and a direct uh, trainee through several generations of Halstead. Halstead is the founder of American Surgery uh, at the Johns Hopkins Institution and he trained uh, Harvey Cushing who trained uh, 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 Blakely, who trained Cooley, who trained me. So I'm about five steps removed from uh, Halstead, which is nice. Uh, Cooley was the most incredible surgeon I ever saw. I still have dreams where I see him doing operations and wondering how did he do that? I just uh, is completely uh, flabbergasted. Anyway, it was an honor and privilege to work there. I worked uh, directly opposite him on a number of uh, occasions. At, at all of the surgeons, there were nine other s- nine surgeons, were incredible. All were great. Uh, one of them, uh, like trombone music, where he found recordings of trombone music. I have no idea, but his room, that's what they played, trombone music, while he did uh, hearts and uh, uh, vascular. So I learned the techniques of vascular surgery there. Uh, and uh, so I also passed my uh, written boards uh, in Dallas that year. And then I went back to uh, uh, Portland as a, uh, a general vascular surgeon. I took my uh, oral boards at, in Spokane, Washington, 
1983 and passed, and I've been board certified ever since, recertified, recertified, recertified. Do you remember the first surgery you ever did that yes. was on your own? On my own. The first one I ever did was a C-section at Long Beach Memorial. Oh, wow. 19-year-old Latino uh, girl, and uh, the uh, uh, obstetrician uh, said, here, you do this. Wow. And I did, and it was awesome. And she was beautiful, I'm sure. Were you nervous? <laughs> no. No, once uh, you grab the steel, you do the job. I remember my first general surgery operation, uh, other than minor stuff. My first major surgery was my first year in Portland. I did a splenectomy. Also, uh, the surgeon uh, who be kind of became my mentor uh, said, here, you do this, and I did a splenectomy, and after that, I started doing more and more advanced cases and uh, knew that this was for me. Anyway, so that was my training, and I spent four years in Portland uh, doing general uh, surgery and some vascular, but not, uh, not enough, and it was hard to get the cases because uh, the guys that were established were... Uh, cherry picking them so the you know if it, one came in through the emergency room when I was on call I would get that but it was hard to get uh, more than a few uh, vascular cases so I started looking around and then uh, I came to California and joined uh, a fairly large one of the early HMOs uh, called FHP and I worked there for five years, and I did a lot of vascular surgery, a lot of really complex general surgery. I was kind of the go-to guy, and uh, it was a very exciting time. I really got my uh, f established as uh, uh, well uh, as a well-recognized guy within the community. I was also one of the first in Orange County to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy. I took one of the very early training courses, and uh, the first year we did about 50 of them once we got equipment. We did the first 50 at an outpatient facility because our hospital still wasn't sold on the idea and wouldn't buy the equipment. So they let me go to this outpatient uh, facility uh, in Huntington Beach, and I did uh, uh, 50 of them that first year, and then they said, yeah, this is the way to go, and so we bought all our own equipment. After that, I then joined a, another group, which is also defunct now, uh, called Friendly Hills Medical Group, and I s uh, became a partner in that group. Uh, but uh, through the turmoil of the, uh, of the end of the uh, century, uh, that group collapsed, and uh, I found myself uh, looking for work again. And I uh, tried my own practice for a number of years in South County, and again, uh, business-wise, it really wasn't for me, and that's when I uh, got recruited and went to, to rural medicine and surgery and out in uh, Tennessee. What advice can you give uh, physicians thinking of uh, surgery and potential fellowships is considering the surgical profession? Well, I have no regrets. The only thing that I would caution uh, young uh, physicians about is that have a longer range picture. Uh, getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're 35 is real fun, real exciting. You you don't need coffee because you're ready to go, but at 55 it's uh, quite a bit different. You're not quite as enthusiastic. Uh, you get up because that's the job you chose and you got to go do it, and so you do it. You do it to the best of your ability. Uh, but uh, have that long-range view in, uh, in sight. If you, if you think maybe I'm not going to be as wide-eyed and bushy-tailed at two when I'm a little bit older, uh, rethink your position. A lot of surgeons now pick subspecialties. They only do breast surgery or they only do uh, a colon and rectal surgery or whatever so they can get out of taking call. And... Uh, I think that's kind of gaming the system a little, but uh, I'm past that point of worrying about it now. Uh, so if you can, or if you want to, or if it, what they call acute care surgeon is not really what you want, then uh, find your hook. 
do advanced laparoscopic surgery, uh, do uh, become a breast surgeon. These are all in the field of general surgery. Uh, vascular surgery now is almost all uh, endovascular. It's all uh, uh, wires and guides. If that's uh, your interest, make sure you get trained in uh, in radiology so that you can't be denied privileges because you can't read the films. Uh, so uh, have a, a longer range vision in sight. I made sure that I was trained in endoscopy so that when I did go to rural uh, uh, surgery, I had that skill behind me. It was very attractive uh, to the uh, recruiters and to the uh, administration at the hospital that they had a surgeon come in who could do his own endoscopy. That was a, a big selling point when I, I did make that transition. In your residency program as a surgeon, did you put to work any of your uh, exposure to the, the trauma? You said the knife and gun club that you were exposed to up in Oregon, or did that not really exist in your subsequent future practice? Uh, the trauma gives you that uh, uh, ability to, uh, to focus so that there's no situation that you can't deal with because you will, even in the most routine of surgeries, come across something unexpected or something happens that uh, is unforeseen and you're prepared to deal with it because you dealt with uh, much higher level critical uh, issues. Uh, when you practice, is there music that you like to listen to? Uh, for many years, I listened to uh, soft rock, but uh, they became uh, very rule conscious. In the last few years I was in practice, they didn't allow us to listen to music. Wow. This, yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, it allows, music is soothing, but it uh, tends to cause you to defocus. And I found that those last few years, I was uh, even more focused than I had been uh, previously. And I insisted, uh, one of my foibles, that people not talk in the operating room unless they had something to say because conversations would be going on between anesthesia and the nursing because they weren't doing anything at the time. Yeah. And I'd have to tell them, listen, I'm trying to operate here. I was a little quiet. Yeah. And so... Uh, uh, I'm not sure people are, uh, can listen to music anymore. Wow, that's interesting. What advice would you give uh, physicians choosing a specialty today? Uh, do what you love. It sounds like that's what you uh, did. That's what I did. Okay. If you had to do it over again, uh, would you pick the same specialty? More than likely, there is a possibility that uh, I might have gone into cardiovascular surgery. When I got to Texas to start my fellowship, there was a notice that there was a residency position in, uh, in a new program in West Virginia. And if anybody wanted it, could just go and take it. But I had just driven uh, uh, either 1,100 or 1,800 miles from Portland to Texas, and it was another 1,100 miles to West Virginia, and I had really kind of committed to the to the program at uh, Texas Heart, and so I said, no, nah, I'm going to stick with this, and I don't really regret having done it. I think about it sometimes, uh, but uh, not with too much regret. How has uh, technology changed since you started oh to gosh. now? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Okay, when I started in surgery, uh, hernia patches were so controversial. Uh, Lichtenstein, who had devised the hernia patch, he was reviled in some quarters. How can you put a, a prosthetic in a hernia? Uh, you're going to get complications and infections and uh, the old style. And then now... Nobody fixes hernias primarily anymore, basically. It's all patched. So that's a dramatic change. Uh, everything was hand-sewn. Uh, when I got to uh, uh, the, ins the, uh, the stapling devices had just been brought over from Russia uh, by, I believe, Hiram Polk from Kentucky, 
who had gone to Russia and visited and took the prototypes for the staplers and they had just started to be used and manufactured in this country so everything was still being hand sewn stapling devices also were controversial and mm -hmm. uh, uh, technologically not very advanced so that's a huge change because everything is stapled now and laparoscopy except for gynecologists and just direct laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy not with TV cameras and uh, video equipment was unheard of uh, when I first started hearing about you know when the the winds about laparoscopy moving to general surgery I took it upon myself to uh, teach myself to to put in ports and I would do that before like an, an appendectomy to visualize and then go ahead and open up for the appendectomy uh, and uh, so I was one step ahead when it was time to transition to laparoscopic surgery so all of these techniques and then they said oh well you can do a normal gallbladder but you can't take out a hot gallbladder through the laparoscope and we proved that wrong well you can take an appendix out but you can't take a gangrenous appendix out and we proved that wrong and then in vascular surgery the, tr the strides have been uh, dramatic whereas once upon a time everything again was hand sewn in anastomoses uh, now it's all critical limb ischemias for salvage and they're doing retrograde uh, wires and atherectomy and all kinds of stuff without doing incisions. I can remember doing a, uh, an aortic aneurysm in three hours and only two units of blood and people would be, oh, that's amazing, that's so good. And now they do it in 45 minutes and uh, 100 cc's of blood loss uh, with the uh, stents and uh, and prosthetics uh, through uh, arterial puncture, so the changes have been amazing. I wonder, like, what how uh, teaching is now because if if there's all this technology, are they focusing on that, or do they teach them like from the beginning? Uh, uh, I'm not sure because I haven't been in a teaching program in a long time, but what worries me is that everything is being done with simulators now. And the actual, uh, I've read uh, many articles about how residents are coming out feeling unsure of themselves and do specialty training just to get some hands-on experience. So in my time, uh, over the course of residency, I did a thousand cases on real people. I don't know how many they're doing now that isn't the simulator or uh, you know computer-generated images and stuff, and that's somewhat worrisome. Yeah. How did you manage work-life balance? Like well, uh, I uh, was single for a long time. And so family issues were not really uh, relevant to me. So I had an active social life outside of the hospital and uh, work always came first. So, so uh, it wasn't a problem. I didn't have any uh, uh, problems uh, uh, being me. So it was all part of the oneness that I, I was seeking at the time. And how did that change when you did found that life partner? Well, that was another advantage of being in rural medicine. Uh, I made sure that I attended every event of my children, which I could not do when I was in California because the demands were so much more. Now, fortunately, my children were very young, didn't have a lot of events, but I know that if I had still been in California, as they were going through school and doing sports events, it might have been more difficult. Uh, so that was an ad one advantage there. But it's very important that you spend quality, you want your children to know who you are. And for a while, I was uh, commuting long distances to work and one day I came home and uh, my wife said, oh, daddy's home. And my uh, child said, who's daddy? And uh, <laughs> yeah. I knew changes were going to have to be made because that was uh, not how I wanted my children to see me. Right. Um, I guess we're getting close to the end. I wanted to ask you, uh, do you feel medicine is still a career worth pursuing? 
if you're not in it for the money, it's the the best thing you can do. If you like helping people, you don't mind uh, the stress. Uh, and uh, again, if you're not a business person, money is not an issue. You'll always make a living. Uh, you'll always do well, but you got to be in it 100%. Great. Well, once again, we uh, appreciate your time, Dr. Gross. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you to all our listeners. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to be a guest or for more information, go to www.pacificcompanies.com.